Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you all for joining us. Standard 10 is what makes the Common Core state standards unique from previous standards documents. Students' growth in reading increasingly more complex text is a separate standard. So what the standard writers were telling us, it's simply not enough to establish that students can comprehend text. We need to ensure that the text they're comprehending become increasingly more complex across the grades. The Common Core writers identified a set of texts that they believed exemplify that complexity, quality, and range over the uh, school years. And they also identified three ways of establishing that texts are increasingly more complex. Now, of these three systems, we hadn't done a lot with qualitative systems in reading education, unlike writing. And the reader in task is left to the purview of teachers. But the one system, type of system, that was ready for prime time were qualitative assessments of text difficulty. Through the staircase of text complexity, in many contexts, administrators and policymakers thought that we finally had a precision and the answer for measuring text complexity. This system, the adherence or emphasis on quantitative measures, was evident among the people who were responsible for the Common Core by their commissioning of a special study that was reported a year ago in 2012 that expanded the number of quantitative systems. In Appendix A in 2010, it had only been Lexiles that had provided the staircase of text complexity. In many contexts, quantitative data are being used heavily. Now, we shouldn't be judging quantitative measurement because of particular measurement types or because of misuses of quantitative data. What I'm going to suggest today is that quantitative and qualitative assessment of text complexity aren't in competition, that with new systems of quantitative evidence that come from large digital databases of text, we actually have the possibility to get insights into aspects of text that we haven't in the past. So what I'm going to say is it's not an either or, that quantitative can actually help us to focus on particular elements, which then we look at more deeply, qualitatively. But one point that I'm going to make is that it's the level of information, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, that really matters. While I'm focusing today primarily on quantitative, what I'm going to start in the first section is to illustrate that there can be similar problems with qualitative assessments when we look at what I'm going to call an omnibus an overall or a compilation of data. So when we get a single number or a single letter or a single descriptor for a text, I'm suggesting whether it's quantitative or qualitative, that's not very useful when it comes to instruction. So let's, let me give you some examples. For my presentation today, I'm going to focus on three texts that were exemplars in the Common Core for different grade spans. And in a sense, a very real sense, because this is typically what we've done in the past, which in fact the Common Core was trying to work against, we have always given these generic assignments that this is a grade four text or this is a grade five text. Okay. So in a sense, this in itself is an omnibus evaluation of text complexity. But when I look at these texts and I read them closely and I start studying them, I'm wondering what it is about Birch Bark House that makes it grade four and five. And A Wrinkle in Time makes it a certain grade span and a not, not another one. In fact, 
Louise Erdrich's language in Birch, Birch Bark House is language that would really engage a lot of adults. Okay, so this is an example of an omnibus measure. We also have lots of examples where a number or a grade level is assigned for an entire text. And that has been the stance with these large digital data analysis systems that have replaced readability systems like the Dale Chaw or the Spatch. When we were doing things by hand, it was difficult to analyze an entire text. We typically did portions. But now with digital analysis, it's very quick to provide a number for a text. But I'm really going to ask about both the veracity of doing that, and can you give a number to an entire text, and what does that number mean? I'm not going to go into detail about some of the issues about readability systems and text difficulty systems, such as ATOS, Lexiles, and so on. I've written about that extensively, and here are actually some references. But we need to keep remembering, and this is something we even talked about as far back as becoming a nation of readers in the mid-1980s, that in narrative, text difficulty systems typically underestimate the difficulty, and in informational text, they typically overestimate. And that's because of some of the characteristics of the text. And like I said, if you want to read more about that, these articles would be good sources for you to start with. Now, we're also seeing, and this is something that I pulled off of one of the websites, we're seeing a lot of systems being offered right now where we attempt to take the three legs of the triangle, the text complexity triangle, and we describe ostensibly we're going to get to a description of the text through applications of all these systems. Okay, so we start with a quantitative, we then have some kind of a rating scheme, and this rating scheme has some usefulness if in fact that was what was being reported, but as you see the goal here is that we're actually the folks who are doing this are actually reporting a general grade level. Furthermore, I'm really going to call into question whether the structure of a text is completely singular or one dimension throughout an entire text. Okay? Now, there's no reason why we couldn't have detailed analyses of individual chapters of books using schemes like this on websites. But that hasn't been the stance we've been taking. People have been using three, these three areas and then referring people to reader and task considerations and coming up with what I'm calling a compilation or an omnibus measurement. Now I think for the people who actually do the measurement, there's a lot of information that they have about the books. For the consumer who sees that, it might be useful if you're just rating a whole bunch of books for some purpose, which I'm not quite sure what that purpose might be. But in terms of providing generic numbers like this to teachers for instruction, I'm suggesting that's not terribly helpful. And the same kind of thing applies to get guided reading levels. Okay? In fact, even more so than the scheme that I've just shown you, where we see the, the ratings that people gave, we see that these are some of the dimensions for the guided reading levels, but we're not certain which of these levels really informed the rater. And in fact, in the case of guided reading, we're not even sure who the raters were or how many of them there were and how they came about their agreement and so on. So, my suggestion here today is we have to ask for what purpose. Perhaps it's useful in assessment, although we'd have to be very clear that our measurement is very, very valid and reliable. But when it comes to instruction, particularly ensuring that we've got the right texts as teachers, 
so that we can guide kids in growing their capacity. Okay, we need to know what is it about this text that might be so unique that my students have, haven't experienced something like this before. And when I'm giving students text for deliberate practice, what is it about this text that matches what we've been teaching, that matches what I know about their capabilities and the features within that text. I want to be clear today that I'm talking about texts that have some level of maturity. And by that I mean not the text at the very beginning levels, where we often exaggerate particular features like decodable words or structures like repeated um, patterns in text. At the end, I'm going to give you um, a URL for where I'm going to present this information on K1 text. But today I'm talking about text for students at about middle or higher grade two and beyond. So I'm going to suggest a couple things that I'm calling counts. So for one thing that we can do, I'm suggesting that numbers matter in reading, and this is something that all of us as teachers can do. When we look at text, we can ask questions about what kind of cognitive processing and memory demands these texts make of kids, and especially looking at the developmental level of students. This might seem a fairly, of course, kind of proposition that I'm giving here. But I wonder sometimes how often we look at the text that we're giving students through their eyes, particularly the eyes of disengaged and or struggling readers. Okay? If I haven't read a lot of long texts before and I'm being asked as a fifth grader to read, read Birch Bark House, that's a fairly heady enterprise. And furthermore, especially if I'm reading it over the course of a number of weeks, the demands on memory might be very, very high. So my first suggestion for something that we can do as teachers is to consider the cognitive processing and memory demands and also the stamina demands that longer texts require or even shorter ones. A second count, I'm going to use the term that numbers and their implications change over the course of the text. Now, we've been in the habit since we got digital analyses of text, not in the era that we were talking about readability around becoming a nation of readers. Things changed with large databases where text could be analyzed and we started getting these single determinations of text, like ATOS gives a grade level, Lexiles give a number on a scale from about zero to 2,000. And the entire text we're led to believe has the same complexity. Now, that very idea in interpreting quantitative information completely goes against any model that we have of comprehension. So if you've listened to David Pearson's presentation on comprehension as part of this um, text project Common Core series, he talked a lot about building a situation model, a term from Walter Kinch. And we would never expect that subsequent sections of a book hold the same demands as the initial sections. Now, sometimes text may get incredibly harder, but in the first chapter, and especially in these books oriented for, and, and I'm talking about Wrinkle in Time and Birch Bart, not necessarily um, Mockingbird, but in the first chapter, when we're writing especially for children and young adults, and often the second one, we're developing a lot of the prior knowledge from that text. We have a lot of discussions about how much prior knowledge we should develop beforehand. But one of the things that we need to remember, even more so in informational text, but also in narrative, that those first chapters 
are presenting new vocabulary, in the case of Birch Bark House, an enormous amount of vocabulary associated with the English Indian, dial, um, Indian language that the uh, chief character is part of or uses. So in terms of vocabulary especially, and also just the load of ideas, the beginning can be very hard. So once you've got some of this background knowledge, we would actually expect that the third and fourth chapters would not be as difficult. Now, this, what I'm doing right here is actually a qualitative analysis, but it turns out that quantitative data also confirm this pattern. Okay, so in the green, you're seeing the entire lexile for these three texts. And in the uh, gold brown, you're seeing the lexile for the first two chapters. And what you're seeing here is that they are substantially more difficult, the first two chapters, than the entire text. And I, in fact, in the rest of this presentation, I'm going to use the, the data from these first two chapters to illustrate interpretations of sentence length and vocabulary and so forth. But I think this is an important thing for us to think about, that texts aren't all complex in qualitative features or in guided reading features. They aren't all the same in terms of all the various dimensions. And sections of text can vary as well. A third point that we need to remember is we need to understand more about what differentiation in sentence length and se sentence structure means. Now, if some of you have heard me speak before, I've been reluctant to give too much meaning to what syntactic difficulty means. It turns out that in these quantitative measures like lexiles, the sentence length is a very strong determinant or predictor of the final measurement. And I've gone through a database of about 2,000 books and have determined what the average sentence length is for different portions of, 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 of the scale. So what you're saying, seeing here is there's a pretty steady progression, um, although in that last category, which spans an enormously large um, number of, of levels of text, um, there's a bigger jump. But what does that mean if we have an average sentence level of 14? I think in the field of reading education, we really need to do some studying. I think um, from looking at lots of texts, writers typically, not always, but usually writers for children and young adults, vary sentence length in a fairly systematic way for their audience. In some sense, it's not unlike when uh, adults speak to young children who are learning to read, excuse me, to speak, we use particular kinds of syntax with them. I think we need to do a lot of work to understand what some of this means. But what I want to suggest here is that quantitatively, and even though as teachers you can't get some of the digital uh, uh, data that I'm using here because you have to have digitized forms of books, I am suggesting that we can start looking at the variation of sentence lengths in different kinds of books. So one of the ways, in fact, that this average comes about is the fact that Louise Erdish in Birch Bark House uses some very, very long descriptions in the first two chapters to set the context. And then there are some very, very short sentences that are actions that follow the context setting. So we've actually got several sentences, about 10 or 15 percent of the sentences that have like 40, 50, 30, 25 words in them. And for fourth and fifth graders, we need to start looking at some of this variation in sentence structure and start asking what would this mean. And this is when my use of some quantitative data. So I've been saying sentence structure varies in length. 
just a simple average that gets put into one of these omnibus measures isn't terribly useful. The issue is, how does the author vary that sentence length? Do they use it consistently? Often, we're going to see authors in the first two chapters setting up context, and then a lot of the action comes later on in the subsequent chapters. And whenever we have dialogue and characters acting, sentences often get shorter. But we can see in these two sentences here that are about 40 words that they're very packed full of ideas. Now, in the first sentence, those ideas, there are some embedded clauses there, but in fact, most of those ideas are and then they, and then they did this. But when we go to the second sentence here, we see that there are not only these phrases like the skeletons of young children, but we also need to know what windigos are which happen to be some um, um, uh, almost cannibalistic creatures that were part of this culture. That's a very complex um, sentence, that second one, especially with the phrase at the end, cracking trees off with every foot, foot crunch. Okay, let me show you one that's even more complex. But if you look up from the paragraph that I'm looking at right here, I think I can actually show you quickly, and she must act. We actually that's a pattern that Erdish uses in the text where there's a lot of description and then there's some decision making. For here she says, oh, she hoped not, how she hoped. Okay, but in this sentence, like a small striped snake, like a salamander or a squirrel maybe or a raccoon, something quick, little, harmless and desperate, she slid, crept, wiggled underneath the sides of the summer house. Now starting out as she does with the metaphor, and she doesn't even keep using the like a squirrel or raccoon. My suggestion here is that some of these sentences are very, very complex. And just looking at a general measure of sentence complexity isn't going to capture that for you. Okay, the fourth element that I want to focus on is numbers can actually un help us understand something about the number of unknown or predicted unknown or hard words in a text. So again, I've gone to the measure that the lexile uses to establish the lexile level and a formula they use mean sentence length and mean log word frequency, which is a logarithm of the average frequency of all the words in the text. And I do want to point out to you that if a word is repeated several times, it's um, always counted as hard. But you see here that of the books that I've analyzed, Euclid's Elements is the very hardest and Green Eggs and Ham is the easiest. So the scale isn't very extensive, but the higher the number, the less complex the vocabulary ostensibly is or the distribution of that vocabulary. We really don't know. All we know is that in the first two chapters of these texts that um, Birch Bark House is a little easier. It's coming close to the Great Gatsby and Don Quixote in terms of its um, mean log word frequency. And that Wrinkle in Time and To Kill a Mockingbird are, are pretty close in the same span. They're all in the same band here, but they're actually a little bit harder. I want to also emphasize that the relationship between the lexile and the word frequency is actually a negative correlation, which you'd expect, because you keep remembering that easier texts have a higher number. Okay, so it's a negative correlation. But the correlation relative to the one that we saw for syntax is very different. So it's not as not as um, high by any degree. Okay, so the other one was uh, what 0.93, this is negative 0.54. So to me, I need some more specific information. And here's where I'm suggesting. Because of the large databases that are being developed, publishers and also the companies that give us text complexity ratings and measures can actually provide us a lot more information about vocabulary. We can have enormous amounts of information about vocabulary. Publishers don't need to be making 
decisions about which of the favorite six to eight words might be taught in a book, we can get an understanding of the entire profile of a text. And let me under let me illustrate with something that I've been working on, which is called the Word Zone Profiler. And if you want to have access to it for research purposes or even for instructional purposes, you need to get in touch with us. It's not for public consumption just because there are so many idiosyncras idiosyncrasies with words that we keep having to refine the measures. And it has about seven or eight aspects to it. One of them is the frequency of the words. Okay, so what this measure tells us that 90% of the words, a little less, in To Kill a Mockingbird come from a group of high and moderate words. Those are the words that I call the core vocabulary. There are 4,000 simple word families. That list is actually on my website for uh, teachers to consult, not for students to take home and memorize. Okay, the other 10%, and this is the pattern that I've discussed quite frequently is endemic of the text, almost any text, 10% of complex texts typically have rare words. Sometimes in technical text it gets down to 15, 10% in narrative is very typical. Okay, so now I'm getting some sense. This number here just told me that, you know, birch bark is kind of like Don Quixote and, and the Great Gatsby not very useful. Now I'm starting to see, okay, we've got a lot of rare words here. So let's start looking at these rare words. And what I'm suggesting is we have the capability in education at this point to be providing teachers with this kind of information and, and even more. And this is the kind of thing we need to begin asking for from publishers of both readability information, text difficulty information and also text. So what I see here in these two chapters is that there are altogether 1,557 unique words, different words in these two chapters and altogether we've got about 5,750 words in that text. Okay, when I look at the rare words, because keep remembering we had all these words from the 4,000 most frequent simple word families it turns out that there are about 345 rare words, which is about six unique words per hundred. Now, that might not seem like a lot if you're only reading 100 words, but if you're reading 5,000 words, that's a lot of unique words that you might not know. So what I want to do is I want to use the facilities that we have now available as researchers and as educational publishers, I want to use those to ask, can I whittle this group of rare words down? Because all it tells me is the kids probably haven't encountered that word in text before. It doesn't mean that they won't know it. Okay, that's what a rare word is. It's just defined on the basis of its frequency. Okay, so rather than just getting this generic measure of frequency as we saw with something like ATOS or Lexiles, Actually, I'm referring specifically to Lexiles here. What I'm going to start asking is, can we look at those words and apply additional quantitative analyses? So remember, and this is very important for those of us who work with English language learners and also with students who are struggling to read, we make a lot of assumptions. The 4,000 simple word families aren't just a bunch of words like the and of and other Dolch words. There are a lot of fairly sophisticated words in that group. In fact, about 60% of the academic word list from New Zealand is included in that 4,000 word families. But I'm assuming that kids, to be able to read complex text by fourth grade, they're going to need to have gotten some fluency with those kinds of words. Now I'm going to see if I could parse the rare vocabulary in greater ways. First of all, I'm going to say that if a word has about five or fewer letters, not all of them, like alien or optic or an act, but a lot of those words are single syllable words. And we know it's multisyllabic words that give kids problems at these grade levels, especially three, four syllable words. 
So what I want to do is I've, I've got some software that permits me to say, okay, we're going to say that those words, now I could actually give those words to a group of teachers, but we counted them in a group outside the words that we think really need some focus in the text. Next, we've eliminated words that are compounds of known words. A lot of those words, especially in a book like Birch Bark House, and that's the one that I'm going to be evaluating here. When we deal with new cultures or with nature, there are often a lot of compound words. I've also eliminated words like auntie, where we have an, um, an, an apex or an inflected ending. Okay, so we've taken out another group of words. And then finally, we use a new database called the Age of Acquisition. For a long time in reading education, we've been using the um, Dale and O'Rourke Living Word Vocabulary and the Word of uh, Age of Acquisition database is much more current. It's not done in a similar manner of actually asking um, <clears throat> students to determine whether they know the words, but it seems to be a pretty valid database. And I determined that if the words were in the oral language of students two years younger than the year we were grade level we were working with, we assume that even if students haven't encountered the word splintered before, when they read it in text and decode it, they should know what the word is. Okay, so when I've done all that, I've actually pared down, I'm calling these vetted rare words. And you notice that I've left non-English words in parens. There are a lot of words from the native indigenous people in Birch Bark House and in Wrinkle um, in the second chapter, one of the um, characters, it's not Mrs. What's It, but another one of them uses a lot of French and German words. In fact, there are probably more than that that, that I haven't um, captured with the analysis that I was doing because I don't have a good um, non-English um, analyzer at this point. But what you're seeing here is that there are ways now for us actually to understand what kids need to be able to do in terms of reading uh, recognition. So, I mean, what I've done is through these data analysis established really clearly that to be able to read this book with any kind of fluency, facility, automaticity, you'd have to have a fair level of decoding with affixes and inflected endings and compounds and also be able to figure out words that are within your age of acquisition span. But in addition now, I've been able to vet out some very key words. And at this point, I do another analysis. On the word zone profiler, we actually have something called the semantic cluster or meta cluster analysis. I've written about this. I should have given you a reference here. Um, it's on <clears throat> the text project website in a research report. It's using Bob and Jana Marzano's semantic clusters. And what we've done is actually tag the words for particular clusters that happen a lot in narrative text. Now, I want to remind you that in informational text, these are typically conceptual clusters that look different. So, for example, with magnetism, we have a different set of words. But of those, I think it was 52, right, 52 vetted rare words, I got all but two of them into these groups of action and motion. Now, the kinds of action that these characters participate in is very, very different. So rummaging and uh, vanquishing are very different kinds of actions. And as you see here, there are similarities between the actions of communication, like insisting and hesitating and grimacing, to different actions that you do physically. But these particular categories, authors of good literature don't keep repeating the word tattered or pliable, but they keep describing the traits of the environment and also traits of people in the environment. They do a lot of description of emotions and feelings, and students need to be understanding the ways in which <clears throat> 
authors capture these words and they also have to, to, to get any kind of generative vocabulary. You need to start seeing how these words fit into, uh, into groups of words and how enigmatic and nimble, even though they're both emotional traits, are very, very different kinds of ideas, but they're ways in which the author is describing particular characters in this text. Once I've done this kind of analysis, so you see here that I've used lots of quantitative systems to come up with some very core words, and now I can start actually using those words to do close reading in the text. So the wind vanquishes the mosquitoes. They're in whining droves. We see the word vibrate here. We can also see that Erdős uses lots of verbs to describe the sifting wind and the lulling roar and the whining droves and the continual lapping sound. Okay, Some of these words like lapping and lulling, sifting, these are little winking. There are, th this author uses lots and lots of those words. And we're not about to start just uh, cherry picking and saying we're only going to handle six to eight words in this text. To actually be able to comprehend it, you need to understand the way in which this author is using very rich language in a particular kind of way. So rather than just focusing on five or six or seven or eight words, we're actually looking at particular kind of groups of words. Um, I want to point out that I'm beginning to collect some of these maps that have come through our analysis in a series on text project that we're calling Close Reading and Vocabulary. Um, at this point, I will after today put the Birch Bark House one up, but we have um, the first two chapters, oh, I, actually only uh, the first chapter of Charlotte's Web. Um, again, keep remembering that the first chapter is often an important one. Author does a lot of context setting and there's often very dense vocabulary. Uh, a final observation about quantitative features of text. I just want to point out that you know, when we go for a physical exam and someone would just say, um, you know, you're a seven in your age group in terms of health, maybe like an app guard for adults, that's not very useful when we just give an overall number. But when we start looking within some of these numbers, we can start seeing the size of the task, particularly for disengaged readers, for struggling readers, for English language learners. Across an entire text, you know, there's a lot of grist here. And we need to be empathetic, but also very strategic in what we're picking to help kids increase in their capacity. And what I've been suggesting today is that generic numbers, whether it's a number that says this text is, um, is a 680, or if it's a level T, or if it's sort of complex in this dimension, that's not very helpful when we're going in to actually determine what it is that our students need to learn and what can grow their capacity, what kinds of text grow their capacity. In particular, I've been suggesting that publishers, especially the ones who have the analyses of text, all of those texts that they give us the numbers on have been digitized. They can provide us with a lot of information about how sentence, uh, sentence lengths vary, about how vocabulary takes on various features and so on, and that this information isn't the only information, and I was attempting today to show how quantitative information can lead to qualitative decisions and lessons, but it can be very useful for getting us to start looking inside the text to see what the task is that students have. I want to point out that um, by September I'm going to do an equivalent presentation on text complexity with um, text in grades K and 1 where I think the situation is very different because we exaggerate particular features and some of these conventional ways of analyzing text quantitatively 
um, very, very much have some problems in terms of their accuracy at, at even um, rank, uh, ranking the text in relation to each other. I want to remind you that our resources at text projects, such as this webinar, are free. Uh, and I also want to remind you uh, that the recordings of the past webinars are all available at our website, as this one will be. And um, by the way, if some of you are looking to use these in teacher education courses and or in professional development, we're very open to having you do that. And we would love to be able to post some of your um, guides that you develop or specific questions or, or any kinds of materials associated with these, um, these webinars and other things that we have up on the Text Project YouTube site or, in fact, any of the other materials. So thank you for your time today, and I'm going to turn it over to Judy so we can have some questions.